Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. This is a follow-up to our interview with Dave Oliphant about the Texas roots of Ornette Coleman. And Dave found this great book called uh, Dance of the Peckerwoods uh, by a musician, writer, uh, man about town, Michael H. Price, and it's an expensive book. It's out of print. Uh, I think it first came out in England, and um, yeah, cheapest version on uh, Amazon is $191, and it goes up from there. However, it's been reprinted in a American version. Um, Michael is a Texan. It's just only a British company would publish it, um, but now it's got an American version. Uh, Brought out by credit where credit is due. Uh, Cremo, st- <laughs> these guys are funny. Um, Cremo Studios, and they are located in Lower Kloppstokia, which obviously is a joke, but hey, what the hell? Anyway, this is a great book, and the new title is Thick Lights, Loud Smoke, and Dim Dim Music, and it's his. Uh, very uh, interesting take on Texas music culture, which he participated in uh, firsthand uh, to to quite a degree. Anyway, there was a time in the early 80s, I remember well, um, when uh, the ba- one of the Bass brothers uh, wanted to develop uh, Fort Worth and created a uh, music venue and invited Ornette to come there to play. And made, a big deal was made about it. In fact, uh, there's even a movie called, um, I don't know, it was made by Shirley Clark. Just look it up. And uh, there's a lot of scenes from, from that Fort Worth visit. And I think the intention on the part of Bass and the, some of the city fathers of Fort Worth was to lure Ornette back to Texas, specifically to Fort Worth. And um, that didn't work out, but that was the goal. Anyway, uh, this Price fella uh, interviewed Ornette in uh, 83 and um, some interesting stuff came up so here's the sections on Ornette from the book I would transcribe it but um, I, I can't I can't spend any more time at a keyboard um, so I'm just going to read it out for you but anyway this comes from the book thick lights loud smoke and dim dim music by Michael H price if you're interested in Americana uh, and uh, music and Americana, this is a really good book, <laughs> um, especially if you want to get deeper into the Texas aesthetic. So anyway, first, um, some historical stuff. And I'm going to start reading right now. This is from page 245. A concise survey is in order. Coleman first latched onto a saxophone at age 14 in 1944 in Fort Worth. Self-taught, he performed with an assortment of R&B bands at venues, including Fort Worth's historic Bluebird Nightclub. When Big Joe Turner operated out of Fort Worth during 1947 to 48, Coleman landed a job as an accompanist. Um, quote, I was kind of an anomaly anyhow, and the, Mac- and the saxophone just cinched that. End of quote, Coleman said. I was trying to be a vegetarian. Imagine that, 1948, teenage vegetarian in Fort Worth. Ornette was different for sure. I was trying to be a vegetarian back then too, 
at a time when no self-respecting Southern Negro would pass up a mess of barbecued ribs or catfish. And I may have been the first kid in town to have my hair marcelled, you know, artificially dekinked. I guess I was a beatnik. Uh, around 1949, Coleman hit the road for the first time with a traveling unit attached to Silas Green's minstrel show, a Chitlin circuit troupe that belonged more to the waning tradition of black vaudeville than to the defunct form of uh, min minstrelsy. Min That's an important distinction. This is black vaudeville, not uh, a minstrel show, even though it was called a minstrel show. Around that time of, that, of his stay in Amarillo, during the same year, Coleman joined Pee Wee Creighton's blues band. Um, unfortunately, he, I guess because the top of the focus was Texas at the time, for Ornette, the whole story of him ending up in New Orleans for a, a good spell is missing from this narrative, which is unfortunate, but we covered it in the interview. Anyway, um, he joined Pee Wee Creighton's blues band. Pee Wee was a good boss, Coleman said, but he preferred that I just notate in the background, more honking, uh, honking along than soloing. And the rumor got around that he was paying me not to take any solos. That pretty much how my reputation uh, got so that it had precede me. Whenever I might try to take myself, uh, wherever I might try to take myself, I was always a good mimic, and that's an understatement. If he heard it, he could play it. Uh, and I could mimic sweet notation as well as imitate Charlie Parker, which went over okay. It would be when I'd try to sound like myself, not like anybody else, that I'd get into trouble with the conventional band leaders. Interesting, right? But it gets even better. Anyway, some, somewhere here along... Now, maybe, again, it was maybe a little bit of showbiz and a little bit of politics, but Ornette says this in a, uh, another chapter. I never really wanted, I never really wanted to leave Fort Worth, Coleman told me, but I couldn't play my horn here the way it needed me to be playing it and still find work. That was back in the day when club owners would post signs backstage reading, Where's the Melody?, so I tried to stay in Texas, anyhow. Wound up in 1949, he would have been 19, in Amarillo, or Amarillo, ever heard of that town? North, northwest of here, at a jazz club, and all around wicked place called the La Jolla, out in the middle of the damnedest, treacherous mudflats you ever did see. I fit in some better there, but it was still no good. All the black cats wanted to keep playing Duke Ellington material as if Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker had never happened. So, so a little sidebar, this is 49. This was, this was the, you know, the golden age of, of bebop, and Ornette was in step with that. Um, Gold, Coleman continued. Now, this is the interesting, interesting, interesting part. Uh, he's out there in Amarillo, Texas, playing at the La Jolla nightclub. Um, the real inventions came down after hours when these hillbilly cats came down on the honky, uh, came from, from down, these, let me start again. The real inventions came down after hours when these hillbilly cats from down on the honky-tonk honky strip would come down slumming with the spades. Um, that's what Michael Price says, Ornette said. This steel guitar man by the name of Billy Briggs, he'd still sit in with us. Oh, he'd, sorry, I'm messing this up. He'd sit in with us on this one-of-a-kind instrument he built for himself and get downright strange with the takeoff solos. He had himself some chops, I mean. That Briggs cat was doing riffs that you just don't associate with any kind of country music. 
a man after my own heart. And if not for that old bugaboo segregation, we probably could have hit things off with some kind of band of our own. Fat chance in Texas. How do you like that? So you got to imagine this. Amarillo, and i got to confess, I don't know where it is, but I think it's out there, uh, jamming with what Ornette describes as hillbilly cats, white hillbilly cats, after hours at the uh, La Jolla Club in 1949. And, and Ornette being thoroughly impressed uh, with Billy Briggs. I don't know much about Billy Briggs. Uh, other than this, he made his own instrument. It was an electric guitar of a sort, but it was steel guitar, excuse me. And he made it himself. And he had his own very unique style of playing. Now, to make a living, of course, he had to play what people wanted to hear, and we're going to play uh, his greatest hit. Uh, and and you, you can you get a sense that he was doing something different sonically. Unfortunately, you know, there's no, as far as I know, there's no material of him really uh, laying out and really playing. Um, but you can hear that he had something going on. So I just, I just this image of Ornette Coleman at age 19 in an Amarillo nightclub after hours jamming with hillbillies. Uh, if that isn't evidence of the Texas roots of or, or Nick Coleman, I don't know. I don't know what is. So um, here's a tune. This was the, the greatest hit of uh, Billy Briggs' career as a commercial artist. And gosh, I, how I wish uh, we had some of his uh, more free, free playing. So music history is a lot richer and deeper and surprising than uh, most of us can imagine as this episode uh, proves. So uh, with no further ado, Billy Briggs. I like to smoke my old corn pipe, but I've chewed tobacco nearly all my life. Smoke cigarettes sometimes, but when it comes to dipping, I'll draw the line. Ting, 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 chew the back, chew the back, chew the back. If you chew the back, don't spit on the floor. Expect the rain in the dust. That's the kind of town that we have in these 
parts for Grapant to do my spearmint, and we have Perryton too. Wheeler and Shamrock in Wellington, Childers, Memphis, Lakeview, and Clarington, Esteline, Turkey, Tulia, and we all love them true. Now of all the towns that I've left out, we love you too, beyond a doubt. I just didn't have room in this song to add all the towns where they belong. Vega, Herford, Canyon, and Silverton, Old Past, Posa, and Canadian. Put them all together and we'll have a panhandle shuffle. hope you enjoyed the podcast if you did please share it that's how we grow and remember to subscribe to jazz on the tube.com the internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos